Okay. Yeah. All right. I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Uh, you should all have a uh, full. Does everybody have a, a folder for tonight yeah. and a pen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So everybody should have a packet. If you can, open the packet. And on the left hand side, there's a seminar agenda. So there's a seminar agenda. If you can take that out, and um, you can take your notes on that, and then if you can, just close the package because you won't need anything else in there for the time being. And then you have the agenda to take some notes. <clears throat> and if you can, if you have a cell phone, if you could just take a moment and uh, take it out and put it on vibrate. This way, um, if there's a call or everything, uh, other people won't be disturbed. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> uh, you're all here to find out about dental implants. This is the dental implant seminar, so thank you for coming. It's a nice night. We appreciate uh, you all taking some time out. And hopefully tonight we're going to show you a couple things about implants. Number one, how implants can help you have a nice, natural-looking smile, the smile you've always wanted. Um, how you can have permanent teeth so that your teeth don't come in and out if that's what you choose or that you have teeth that you don't have to glue in anymore, so that you don't have to use a uh, denture adhesive, and how you can eat and smile with more comfort and confidence. So, uh, you all have your reasons for being here, and um, hopefully we'll address all your concerns tonight. <clears throat> Let me give you an overview of the evening, what we're going to discuss. First, uh, a little bit of an introduction. I'll tell you about myself and my, uh, my co-host tonight, Dr. Jim Waltman. We're going to discuss some common concerns that people have about dental implants how implants can improve your smile. We're going to discuss uh, also the cost of dental implants. So that factors into everyone's decision about what to do. So we're going to go into uh, detail on that to give you an idea. We're going to discuss some of the factors in selecting the best professional to place your dental implants. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Okay? So with that as an introduction, uh, let's get going. One other thing, if you do have any questions uh, during the course of the seminar, just jot them down on your agenda for two reasons. Number one, if we stop to answer a lot of questions along the way, the seminar will run late, uh, later than we want to. We want to get you out on time. And also, a lot of the questions may be answered by the end. So at the end, if I haven't addressed your question, we'll have time for questions and answers. Okay. Very good. So who am I? My name is uh, Dr. David Scharf. I'm a periodontist and dental implant specialist. And I practice just down the road a mile or so in Babylon. So in Babylon Village, right on Montauk Highway. Everybody know where Jamelis is? Pretty much? Everyone knows Jamelis, right? Jamelis? Yeah. So uh, I practice right across the street from Jamelis. I've been there for uh, 28 years. I went to both undergraduate and dental school in Boston University. And I did my periodontal and implant training at New York University. I became board certified in 1995. I'm a clinical assistant professor at New York University College of Dentistry, where I teach dental implants to uh, specialists who are training in dental implants. Uh, and I, I've placed over 11,000 dental implants in my career, probably closer to 12,000 at this point. So what does all this mean to you? To give you a frame of reference, I'm somebody who's well-versed in implants. I've been doing them for uh, most of my career, and I've placed probably as many or more implants than most people on uh, Long Island, if not the country. So I'm well-experienced, and I bring that experience to tonight's program uh, and to your treatment. <laughs> I'm the author of, I just had my first book published, The, the Smart Patient's Guide to Dental Implants. Uh, and this lecture was in part an out, outgrowth of that, so that's available on Amazon if you want to get a copy of that book. And we have them in the office as well. Uh, for the last five years, uh, the Long Island Press has a contest, Best of Long Island contest. And our office was uh, voted Best Dentist on Long Island. And that's only because Dr. Waldman didn't enter the contest. Otherwise, we would have split it, I'm sure, because they have a terrific office. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Academy of Osseo Integration, so the Academy of Osseo Integration is the premier dental implant organization in the country for professionals. I'm a fellow of that organization, and I'm on the board of directors of the North American Society of Periodontics. I've been on the board of directors since 2007. Uh, and last but not least, I have over 2,500 hours of continuing education beyond my residency training. So every year, I, I take approximately 100 hours of advanced continuing education training we need to stay on the edge of what I'm doing. So just to give you some sense of what I bring to the table in uh, tonight's program and in your care. And my co-host tonight is Dr. Waltman. Everybody turn around. 
Can we say hi? I have the big mouth, but he is, so he gets to sit in the back. But I want to introduce Jim as well. So I'm a periodontist. My specialty is placing dental implants. And he's a restorative dentist, and his specialty is restoring the dental implants, making the beautiful teeth on top. And, and we work as a team. So we're colleagues. We don't, we're not partners in a practice. We don't have a business relationship in that sense. We have separate practices. But we treat many, many patients together, and we have a close collaboration. So that's why we're doing this together tonight. Uh, Dr. Wolf has been in practice in Massapequa for 14 years, and his practice is right near the train station in Massapequa. So if you take Sunrise Highway, you go by the Massapequa train station, by Hicksville Road, right near that intersection, he's a stone's throw from there. So also very, very close, very easy to get to. Jim grew up right here in West Islip, West, West Islip uh, High School. Okay. West Islip High School. He went to uh, Boston College, undergraduate, and went to Tufts University for dental school, where he graduated high honors. Dr. Wolfman did his postdoctoral residency at Nassau County Medical Center, and he currently teaches at Nassau County Medical Center. So why that's important to you is when you have a doctor who teaches, it's very easy as a dentist just to become cloistered in your office and not have a lot of professional interaction. But when you see somebody who not only practices but teaches, and I believe donates his time to teach, that's not a, most of the people don't get paid to teach, um, you know that he, he's always bringing his A-gate because the residents are always keeping us on our toes. And he's completed advanced training at the Pankey and the Dawson Academies. And those academies are, you've probably never heard of them, but within dentistry there are these elite academies where dentists who want to really get to the highest level of work that they can do, um, they go there to take advanced training in restoration, crowns, bridges, difficult restorative cases. So what this means to you is that when it comes time to make the teeth on the implants, he really brings a lot more to the table than just your average dentist who hasn't had these, these trainings. They're quite exhaustive. <coughs> And he has behind him a pretty significant team as well. He's part of the Greater Long Island Dental Health Associates in Massapequa. They're a group practice that's 47, 48 years old. They're one of the oldest group practices on Long Island. So they have patients of every, every generation in their practice, probably the, you know, three generations easily of patients in their practice. And they're one of the finest dental practices on Long Island. And that's uh, part of their team. Okay. So with that as some introduction of who we are, uh, let me tell you a couple of stories. This is Christina, and Christina used to have partial dentures. And some of you may have partial dentures. They, they clasp on the teeth and they come in and out. Right? And one of the things that Christina didn't like about her partials, like most people, is that they would come in and out, they would rock, and she would feel very insecure with those partials. And you know, she, she soldiered on, she did the best that she could, but you know, the reality was is that she, they slowly sapped her confidence. Right? She was a bright, cheerful person. She had a great husband, has a great husband. Um, but those, you know, bit by bit, those partials ate away at her confidence because she would talk and they would come loose, or she'd have to go out to eat. And did she put enough glue in? Would, you know, was someone going to see them moving? She couldn't. She get food underneath. She just hated them. And eventually, she got to the point where she said, "I have to do something. I can't live the rest of my life like this." And she found out about dental implants. She came into the office and she decided, "Well, I, I want to investigate this." And Christina's big uh, concern was really, "Well, what's the surgery like? What is the procedure like?" And we put her in touch, actually, with other patients who had had dental implant surgery. She, she spoke with them. She developed a comfort level. She did, she did her implants. And like most people, she was surprised at how easy the surgery is. It's really very easy from the patient's perspective. Um, and now her partial dentures have been replaced with implants. And Christina will tell you, I'm not afraid to smile now. Having dental implants restored my confidence. And we hear that a lot. People don't say it restored my function or how I look, but I feel confident again. I feel like when I had my teeth again. And here's uh, Eugene. So Gene, um, when he went into the service, what happens when you go to the service? First thing they do is, you get a physical, and then they take out all the teeth, right, that may be bad teeth. So they took out his teeth, and he got out of the service. Didn't, you know, didn't, he kind of let things go. He had his family, he had other issues. And he ended up at a very young age in dentures. So he lost his teeth in his 30s. Right? And for those of you who have no dentures, no teeth, you know that the longer you're in dentures, the harder it is to wear those dentures. And as 30 years passes, there's not a lot to keep those dentures in place anymore. He just couldn't wear them. Half the time he would leave them out. His wife was unhappy that she would leave them out. He couldn't eat his foods. And he's a mechanic. He's a hardworking guy. And he had a lot of responsibilities. Get my kids through college, pay for my daughter's wedding, all that kind of stuff. But he finally came to the realization that that's all cleared away and now it's time for me. And like many people, again, Gina heard about dental implants. And for him, his biggest concern was, you know, the money. Can I fit this into my budget? Um, He'd heard that they're expensive, and really he came in and he was, 
surprised to find out that, well, they're not inexpensive, but compared to what I spend money on in the rest of my life and how much enjoyment I'm going to get, it really isn't a terrible investment. And he, he, he got his implants, and what he said was, you know, after 30 years with no teeth, I forgot how great it is to eat whatever I want and to laugh and smile with confidence. And why do we forget? Because it happens bit by bit, right? I always say, imagine if I could snap my fingers and give you back the body you had when you were 25 or 30, right, just for a day. Right, you say, wow, that would feel great. I can move better, I can run, I can remember what I had for breakfast, whatever it is, right? But because the changes happen so gradually, we adapt to it. But when people get implants and, and the restoration happens so quickly, it's really dramatic and people just blossom again. I had a patient just the other day, we saw her last week, and she, had, she was always ashamed of how her teeth looked. She never smiled, she never really took care of her appearance. We put her implants in, she had a bridge put on the next day, a beautiful bridge, it was a Friday. Um, she had a bridge went in Friday. That Friday night, she was out partying all night with her friends, no one could tell, and she came in this week for her post-op check, she had had her hair done, she had a haircut, she had it colored, and she had glossy lipstick on. And I said, boy, I've seen you four or five times, you've never had lipstick on, have you? She goes, I never wanted anyone to look anywhere near my mouth. He goes, now I love it, I want people to look. She goes, my friends don't know what's wrong, what's changed, they just say I look better. So, uh, so those are the types of things we hear very commonly. So it's really only after people lose their teeth that we realize what we've lost. And you know that's very common. How many times in life do you have something and you don't really appreciate that you had it until you've lost it? Okay? But fortunately, with dental implants now, we have the technology to help to give people back their teeth. This is Jim, another mechanic. And uh, Jim was single, single father, actually, wanted to meet somebody, settle down, and, and enjoy family life again. And uh, this is the biggest he ever smiled. So he had a nice big, you know, bushy mustache. I think he trimmed it just for the picture. But he never smiled and showed his teeth. And can you guess why? Right? Because those were his teeth. Right? And he was a friendly, he was the kind of guy, you know, the kind of people you meet them, they always have a joke for you. You know, they always have a kind word. A real gentle soul. But for a variety of reasons, at 42, these were his teeth. And he said, I can't, I can't, I'm embarrassed to, to date somebody, to socialize, to have anyone look in my mouth. And he just had no confidence to, to meet somebody. And that was his, his thing. He was very uncomfortable with his teeth. And so let, this was his before, and this was his after. Okay. So look at his smile. And it's hard to tell from the close-up, but the goatee's gone. <laughs> so typically what we see is sometimes people have a lot of facial hair. They don't like the way their teeth look. They get their dental implants, and the facial hair goes away because they're not afraid to smile. Uh, so he's just smiling all over town. And this transformation took place in one day. He took out his teeth, put his implants in, the bridge went on the next day, and so he, you know, this is how he looked on the weekend, smiling and happy. So it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out process. And, you know, what he said to me was, I had heard about implants, you know, I knew about them for years and years, and I never took the time to really find out about them, and I hemmed and hawed. And again, his hope was the cost, you know, which it is for many people. And he said, I just came to the realization that I spend money on cars, I spend money on vacations, I give, you know, money to this, money to that. He says, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have it for the rest of my life. He goes, what's the next 40 years worth to be com comfortable and confident to be happy? And um, it's very, you know, I can't even say I've ever had a patient who made that investment and felt that they regretted it. Uh, certainly he doesn't. This is Teresa, and Teresa's 74, and she's very active in her community. So you guys all live locally, I assume. She used to live in Brooklyn, so she would drive to Babylon from Brooklyn, and we would treat her. And then she decided to move closer, and she overshot. She lives in Bohemia now. so. She should have moved to Babylon, but I had done some other implants for her. She's a very active woman, you know, in charge of bingo in her condo community, organizing trips, all that kind of stuff. And she called me up one day and she said, Dr. Sharp, I've been on a bagel this morning and I snapped my lower tooth. She was in a panic. And uh, she was my, my granddaughter's wedding is in two weeks, oh my God, i got to have a tooth, what am I going to do? I said, Terry, don't worry, calm down, I'm coming to the office, we'll take care of it for you. So she came in and in about an hour's time, a little less than an hour, I took out her tooth. I put a dental implant in right where the space used to be, and we put a temporary crown on the dental implant for her. So in an hour's time, she left the office, smiling, happy. She, she didn't even miss a beat. She came in by 9, she was out of the office by 10. Granddaughter's wedding two weeks later, not a problem. And then we ultimately made her the crown. So sometimes we use implants to fix small problems, small problem in the mouth, but still a huge problem in her, it would have been a huge problem in her life. A couple more cases I want to show you how implants have helped people. So this is Julia. And Julia at the time was 59, and she, she would watch her grandchildren. So like many of you, I'm sure your kids work, or you, know, you need somebody to watch the grandkids. So it was her job to watch the grandkids. And she was 
terrified of the dentist. Her whole life she was terrified of the dentist. And she had this bridge done many, many years ago. And what you can't really tell from this picture is that this bridge moves when she talks. Okay? So it's barely held in on one side. It's not held in on the other side. And that's how she smiles. And she smiles that way because she's really holding her teeth in with her lip. right? But she was so afraid of the dentist that she just couldn't think of doing anything. Until one day she was babysitting her grandchildren, right? And, and I'm sure some of you have grandchildren. And you know when grandchildren are like four or five years old, six years old, they don't filter anything. They just say what's you know, on their mind. So her granddaughter said, Grammy, how come your teeth move when you talk? <laughs> right? So that was it. She said, I, I don't want my grandchildren growing up seeing me with no teeth or loose teeth or whatever. And her biggest fear, so she had heard about implants, but her fear was the anxiety of getting it done. She came into the office, and we let her know, well, you can be sedated if you want. So if you want to be sedated, just like for a colonoscopy or something like that, you can be sedated. You're sedated. We do your implants. You wake up. Sedation is over. Your teeth are in. Said, I didn't know you could do that. Bing, bang, boom. That's what she did. And, um, and now she's done. So now she decided to have a type of bridge that snaps in and out, which we'll show you. But now she can smile. She can laugh. She can eat what she wants. Uh, and she never has to worry, you know, if I'm in the hospital, my teeth need to come out, or someone's going to see me without my teeth. So, and again, at a, at a young age, at 59, we solved this problem for her, and she'll have decades and decades of use from that. Again, some, some implant patients are quite young. So this is Jackie, and Jackie, at the age of 34, had um, her tooth, uh, she had a root canal on a front tooth. The root canal, the tooth, root canal failed, and the tooth cracked. So this tooth had to come out. And her choice was to do a dental bridge where you grind down this tooth and grind down this tooth, or just replace what was lost and put an implant in. So we took out her tooth, we put the implant right in, put a temporary crown on, and here's the case a couple months down the road when it's all finished. Okay. Really good as new. What we did was swap out her bad root, put a dental implant in, and put a crown on top. So that's very, very common as well. This is Arlene. And Arlene came to me at age 57, and she has a degenerative disease, Lou Gehrig's disease or something like that. So she knew going forward that she was going to deteriorate, and she kind of knew the time frame she was going to deteriorate on. And these were her teeth when she came in. So, you know, look how long these eye teeth are, look at the spaces. She didn't love her teeth for sure, and they, what you can't see from the slides that they were loose. And she knew that as time passed that she was going to degenerate. So she knew, you know, probably a year from now I'm going to use a cane, and three years from now, I'm going to have a walker. And four years from now, I'll be in a wheelchair. And probably seven years from now, I'll be in a nursing home. I won't be able to come into your office anymore. And she's always very upbeat and very cheery. And she said, look, I can't control. She had been a, she says, I can't control. My, my full physical body is not mine to control anymore. But I can certainly control how my mouth is going to be for the rest of my life. And the one joy I'm going to have until the day I die is to be able to chew my food and to eat and smile. Because I don't want people visiting me with no teeth in my mouth. And when I can't walk and I can't move, I still want to be able to eat. Even if someone has to feed me, I want to be able to chew my food. What can we do? And what we did was um, we took out these teeth because they were really all no good. And we put in some implants and made her a bridge. So now fast forward, this is six or seven years later, and now she's up to the walker phase, you know, so, and she's probably getting close to the wheelchair phase, but every time she comes in, despite her situation, she's very upbeat, and I always say, Angela, your teeth are so beautiful. She goes, Doc, I love these teeth. And I know the day is going to come when I don't see her anymore. She, it's much harder for her to come in, but at the back of her mind, she knows I'm always going to have these teeth, I'm always going to be able to function. And how... how of the last part of our life, how many things can we control? Not many, right? But she wants to control how her teeth are. And you all can control how your teeth are as well. It's the choices that you make. Sometimes people have a partial denture, a removable partial denture, right? So for those of you who don't know, this is what a partial denture looks like. It's got, you know, replaces some of the teeth. It's got this metal part that goes across the palate. And this patient had a partial denture, and the partial denture uh, used to just attach to these crowns in the front. So there were these interlocks in the crowns, and that's where the partial denture attached. But the problem was that the partial denture used to sort of rotate. It used to move, and because it moved, it loosened up the crowns. So a couple years into the case, um, the crowns kept coming off, and this tooth, this eye tooth, was all decayed underneath. Okay. So the patient had just spent you know, a pretty good sum on this, this dentistry, and even though they know partial dentures are destructive, she did it anyway. But what we were able to do is we were able to take out the bad eye tooth, and if we just put the partial denture back on, what would have happened? It just would have kept coming loose, right? Because it wasn't engineered properly from the beginning. 
So all we did was add one dental implant for this patient on the side where we took out the eye tooth and put the, a different, an attachment right into the partial denture. So the same partial denture, the same bridge, just added a little more support, the patient was on their way. That bridge doesn't come out anymore and it has much greater support. So here's another way to use a dental implant. It doesn't have to be a single tooth or a whole mouth. It can help to hold in a partial denture. And we do that quite frequently. A partial has a couple teeth that are holding it in. One of the teeth are lost. We don't want to, the patient doesn't want to get a whole new partial, but we need support. We put an implant in and attach the partial to that implant. Pretty neat, right? So today, really, dental implants are the best replacement options for many patients. And um, why is that? You know, you've all heard about implants and that's why you came here. And, you know, implants have grown exponentially in the last 20 years. And the reason for that is, if you think about why you've lost your natural teeth in the first place, or if you have, number one is through cavities, right? Or caries, as we call it. So dental implants don't get cavities. So if you're someone who's always getting cavities and always putting new crowns on teeth, and then always replacing them because you're getting cavities, don't be surprised when you get another cavity, because that's your disease. Dental implants don't get cavities. Number two, people lose their teeth from gum disease. That's very, very common. Dental implants don't get gum disease. So for a lot of patients who've been battling with gum disease over the course of their life who've lost their teeth, dental implants are not affected by that. And number three, people lose their teeth because they either crack or they have root canals that fail. Dental implants don't need root canals and they don't crack. So as where 20 years ago we used to jump through hoops to save questionable teeth, and we still do that sometimes, but more times than not, it's more cost effective and much more durable to put dental implants in. Okay? So we can use dental implants to replace a single tooth like I've shown you. We can use dental implants to replace multiple teeth. So here's just a model of somebody, and they were missing two teeth on the lower left, so we put two implants in and two crowns on top. So the implant is just the root, and then a crown goes on top of the implant. It's not one piece, crown and root. On the other side, this person was missing four teeth, and we put in three implants to replace four teeth. So in general, two implants for two teeth, you would put in two implants for three teeth, sometimes two, but usually three implants for four teeth, and if you're replacing a whole arch of teeth, you can do that with four implants, believe it or not. They're so strong. This is just five. It's an old slide. But if you have two in the back and two in the front, you can have a bridge that's held up just by four implants, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. okay? And you can do that on the top and the bottom. So these look almost like a denture, right? It's got the gum and the tooth component. It looks almost like a denture, but it screws right into the implant, so it doesn't come in and out. <clears throat> So, um, of all the things that we do in dentistry, implant restorations, crowns and bridges and dentures supported by implants, really have become the most routine, predictable, comfortable and affordable procedures that we have. So, it, um, certainly comfort is easy, they're extremely predictable now, and they're, they're, I do implants every day as does Dr. Woolman, so it's just a routine part of our practice. 20 years ago when I would speak to patients about implants, I had done hundreds of implants already, but I'd speak to patients about implants, they had never heard of implants before, so they were very, very reluctant. Now, people come in, like you guys, you've all heard about implants, and, um, and you, know, you want to find out more about it. So they're very, very predictable. So let's talk about dentures for a minute and partial dentures. So why are dentures so hard to wear? Right? Most people who have dentures either hate their dentures top and bottom, or they really hate the bottom and they tolerate the top. So why are dentures so tough to wear? Okay, what? Many times when denture patients come into the office, they have a bag and they have four or five sets of dentures they dump out on the desk. <laughs> you smile, right? You have four or five sets in a bag, you're dumping it. So they dump them all out on the desk and say, ah, I went to this dentist, that dentist, that. Do you know somebody that can make me a good set of dentures? That's how they come in. And I ask them who they've been to for their dentures and they tick off all the good dentists in the area. I know them, I know them all. I know this guy's good, that, that guy's good. And what I explain to them is that their ability to be comfortable in a denture has very little with the dentist's ability to make a good denture, right? So dentures are, are dentures. They're not, they're, it's very hard to get a pair that's really comfortable. And the longer you wear them, the harder it gets. And it gets harder, as I'll show you, because the jawbone resorbs it and melts away. So if you think about shoes, if you can make the shoe analogy, I'm, I'm sure everybody here has tried on a pair of shoes in the store that maybe your friend has, and the friend says, they're the most comfortable thing in the world. And you put them on, and like, oh, these are horrible. I can't wear these shoes. It's very individual, right? It's very individual. <clears throat> so why is this so difficult? If you look at how someone's jaw is, so you have the tooth, you have the bone, and you have the gum, when you first take someone's teeth out and put a denture in, the denture kind of has some gum tissue to hang on to, right? To give it some resistance to falling out. 
But as time goes on, this bone starts to melt away because it doesn't have any tooth stimulating it. So you use it or lose it. So the tooth comes out, the bone is no longer stimulated from the inside, and then the pressure of the denture only accelerates that problem. So fast forward, now what you have is all that bone is gone, you have this gigantic denture, which is very unstable, just resting on the ridge. So you move your tongue, or you move your cheek, and it goes flying around. You can make a hundred dentures. It's not a factor of the skill of the dentist, it's a function of there's nothing for that denture to hold on to. And worse than that is, the nerve in the lower jaw that used to be on the side is now on the top as more bone resorbs. So some people can't wear their lower denture because the denture presses right on the nerve and they get that electric shock. Like when you hit your funny bone, you know, you get that shock. So that's the issue that, that people have many times. And these, um, so that, that sometimes is compensated for by relining the denture, right? The dentist makes a bigger denture, a thicker denture, but that only makes it more unstable because you're adding more, you know, more and more distance between where the denture is and where it rests. These facial changes that occur when people lose, lose their teeth are, are really pretty common. Okay? So what we see is when someone has their teeth and they have all that normal bone, um, their lips are like they are when they were young, and these creases are not excessive. But as, as the, the bone starts to melt away, the, the bite starts to collapse because the bone is melting away. And as the bone melts away, the lips start to turn in. The lips eventually disappear pretty much. The creases between the nose and the mouth and the mouth and the chin all deepen. Right? So that's not a consequence of aging. That's a consequence of what we call loss of vertical dimension. You have the same size denture and the bone just melts away. So in effect, it closes down. And as it closes down, that's why those changes occur. Right? So what do people do to compensate sometimes? They buy adhesive, right? People spend billions and billions of dollars every year on denture, denture adhesive for some type of relief. And interestingly, up until a couple of years, denture adhesive used to have zinc in them. And there were cases of zinc toxicity where people had dementia. And the dementia wasn't from dementia, it was because of too much zinc ingestion. Because they would take the tube, you know, squirt it in there two or three times a day, and glue it into their mouth in hopes of having some kind of satis satisfactory function. For any of you who use denture adhesive, you know it's a misery. It's sticky, it's gooey, it doesn't taste very good. You have to make sure you have enough in there when you go to eat. Who needs it, right? <coughs> So implants can make it so you can throw the denture adhesive away and never have to use it again. So how do we help people? Here's somebody who's missing all their lower teeth, right? And so what we did was we put two dental implants in, in the front of the jaw, one here, one here. And the denture, then inside the denture, we put the other half of the snap. So the denture has like a ball attachment on it, and then a snap goes in the denture, and the denture just snaps in and out of the implants now. So no more adhesive, no more glue, snap in, snap out. And we can adjust how tight it snaps in and snaps out. So for some people that want it super tight, we can make it super tight. For some people that want it less, we can adjust that, right? What a service to have we can snap in and out, no more glue, no more worrying if you laugh or sneeze or smile, you know, your teeth will come flying out. <clears throat> and many times, we can use the patient's own denture, right? I just treated a patient this morning who was at this seminar last month or two months ago, we just put two implants in his lower jaw, and in a couple of weeks, Dr. Walton's going to use his existing denture, put those attachments in, and he's on his way. Okay? So that's terrific. Here's another way we help someone who has a lower denture. Is again, sometimes we put in four or five implants and attach the denture to the implants. So you don't need one implant for every tooth to go in. It, like pylons holding up a pier, you can have a couple of, you know, one implant on the back on each side, one implant on the front on each side, and that's very stable, and you can attach the denture to that. Okay? So that doesn't come in and out at all, and that doesn't even press on the gum tissue. So imagine being able to eat nuts or seeds or any of that kind of stuff, and not have the nuts or seeds get caught underneath the denture or press underneath the denture. That's what that will do. Okay? And here's what an uppercase looks like. So for a lot of people, what they don't like about an upper denture is what? is the palate, right, covering the denture, because you can't taste as well, it's, it's, not, it's not pleasant. So we can, again, put in the implants, and then have a bridge that kind of looks like a denture, right? It's got a tooth and a gum component, and I'll tell you why we need that in a second, but the palate is completely open. So this, he, can, he can taste his food just like he tasted it, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And the reason it has to look like this is his gum is all the way up here because he'd been without teeth for so long all that bone absorption occurred. So if we just had teeth, the teeth would have to look like giant piano keys. So we want the teeth are framed by gum 
and we make that junction line, we're very careful to look so that junction line is high enough so you don't see it. So when he smiles, he doesn't have a very high smile. We always want to make sure that nobody sees that except when they pull down the butt. Okay. So that's a great way to help somebody uh, with that issue in the top. What about someone who has a partial denture? <clears throat> so the problem with a partial denture, if you look up there on the top, let's see if it works. You see how it wiggles? So as the partial denture wiggles, it's rocking that tooth. So, so if you ever had a tooth taken out, you all probably had a tooth taken out at one point or another, right? How do we take out teeth? The same way they've been extracted for thousands of years, right? <laughs> I took out a tooth of my dad recently. He said, you know, it occurred to me while you were doing it that the technology for taking out teeth probably hasn't changed in a thousand years. He said, you're probably right, except we have Novocaine now. So what do we do? We grab it and we rock it, rock it, rock it until it rocks out and comes out of the bone. Well, what's this doing? That clasp every day is rocking the tooth, rocking the tooth, rocking the tooth. And that's why when people get partial dentures held in by teeth, we tell them, look, probably three to five to seven years, expect to lose some of the teeth that that partial denture is clasped onto, and then you have to have a bigger partial denture. So partial dentures tend to be pretty, pretty destructive. Okay, so how do you replace that? Well, what you do is you put a couple implants in, and then you make a bridge, so these are the teeth that are connected to the implants. Right? So no more partial denture, and because this person had not lost a lot of height of bone, this, these bridges could just be teeth. They look just, just, looks just like a, a tooth-supported bridge. Okay. So that's how we get rid of partial dentures. Okay, so let me show you this, see if it works. So look at the facial changes that occur when someone loses their teeth. Remember I said the lips turn down, the chin and the nose get closer together, right? The creases get deeper, and you lose your hair. I don't know why you lose your hair when you lose your teeth, but apparently you do according to this video. But the point I want to make is this fa these facial characteristics occur because of all that bone loss. And if we can put the implants in before that bone loss occurs, the bone loss doesn't occur. Because the implants stimulate the bone just like your natural teeth used to stimulate the bone. So the same, the youthful appearance that you have, if you have those teeth in there, or if you haven't lost bone yet, it stops that bone loss so you don't continue to lose. Okay. So that to me is the other miracle of dental implants, is it preserves your skeleton. Think about that. Without that, your skeleton is going to disappear, wither, atrophy. With it, that doesn't happen. Okay. So let's take a look at Noriko. Noriko had dentures for 30 years, right? Just like Eugene. They could have, they could have met at the denture clinic. Um, she had dentures for 30 years, and she hated her dentures, but she never complained. Right? Her upbringing was, to, I'm never, you know, she just wasn't the type to complain to her husband, to complain to anybody. <coughs> But her husband knew that she was miserable. Um, she didn't want to go out to eat. He could just tell, you, know, you could tell when you're married to someone, but she never ever complained. And um, when the kids graduated college, so the kids usually come first, the kids graduated college, and they, you know, they started to say, let me put that money towards the teeth. And she didn't want to spend the money on herself. It was her husband who said, let's get this done. He didn't want to, you know, he just didn't want to see her be unhappy for that long, and he knew that that, that would resolve her problem. And that's what she did. So she did her implants, and now she, you know, she looks back and she said, you know, life is too short. I can't believe I was so unhappy for so long. Uh, life is short, and the older you get, you know, that life seems to get shorter and shorter. Um, now she can enjoy nuts, corn, fresh vegetables again. How many, you know, all those foods that, oh, I can't eat that, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. Now she's full steam ahead eating whatever she wants. <clears throat> and many times we see this. Many times the, the spouse of the patient comes in, and the patient is reluctant to do anything, and in effect, the spouse says, I don't want to live with you miserable for the next 20 or 30 years. I, you know, I want you to be happy. I want you to do this. It affects us as a couple, not just you and I'm coming along for the ride. So what are the, some of the advantages of dental implants? Well, certainly there are functional advantages. Being able to eat whatever you want. You know, you can have, because, because the, whatever that prosthesis is, a denture or a bridge, no longer comes in and out, it's more like your natural teeth. So you can, it doesn't come in and out, so you can eat whatever you want. You don't have to use adhesive. So adhesives help, but they're certainly not like having your own teeth. So you don't need adhesive, and you can chew any food that you want. So if you want steak, um, we, choose, we always choose the menu here very carefully, you know, to make soft food, because we assume most, many people coming have that issue. It would probably be smarter to have like corn and apples and all kinds of food people can't eat. Like, oh, I can't eat this, that's not good. Uh, but you can chew any food that you want. <clears throat> and then early on when we started doing implants, people were concerned about how would people see the implants? Would people always feel like, 
these implants who are artificial in their mouth, were they fake, were they something that um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to get used to. And what people, what's, uh, what the research showed is that number one, people with implants almost universally had increased self-confidence. And this study was done on people who had dentures, full dentures, that replaced their denture with either a snap and snap out or a, a fixed bridge. And they found that people have increased self-confidence, increased social activity. Why would they have increased social activity? Well, if you're not afraid that your teeth are going to fall out during dinner with your best friend, you don't mind going out to dinner with your best friend, right? Or you don't mind laughing or doing all that kind of stuff. So people would get their social life back, which would, of course, lead to an enhanced quality of life. And this is the point I wanted to make, is that people accepted the bridges as part of, part of themselves. So like these glasses, sometimes I have these glasses on, and I've worn glasses for five or six, maybe eight, eight years. And sometimes I go to wash my face, I forget I have glasses on, because I just don't realize I have glasses on. It's the same thing when people have these type of prostheses. They don't think to themselves, oh, I have this implant thing in my mouth. They just think that it's their teeth. So they're not, they're not seen as foreign. Right? So you can go out, you can enjoy it. You don't have to pass up the invitations anymore. You don't have to not go out to dinner. And when you go out, uh, you can have what you want. <clears throat> what other benefits do we see? Again, they look and f they function and look like natural teeth. So a very common question we get at these seminars is what will my implant teeth look like? Will they look natural? And certainly, when you have a dentist like Dr. Waldman making your teeth, they, they, they can look perfectly natural and look great. So my job is to do the foundation. So really nobody sees my job. But if I, if I don't do my job right, he can't do his job right, and eventually it all falls out. So do, putting the implants in properly is important. When people say, wow, your smile's great, or when patients look in the mirror, it's really having a talented dentist like Dr. Waldman that makes a difference. And they don't all come out that way. Many dentists don't have that level of training, but do it anyway, and the results aren't the same. Uh, this is great. The teeth will not fall out when eating, laughing, or sneezing. You ever have that big sneeze? <laughs> you know, when your denture falls out? Yep, that's, that's not fun. Um, and improved health. So why would you have improved health with an implant prosthesis? One of the biggest reasons is nutrition. So there have been studies done where they, they take people who wear dentures, and they, have, they give them food, and they have them chew the food, and then the people you know, spit it out, and they spit into a sieve to see what the particle sizes of the food. And then they have people with implant bridges do the same thing. And what they find is that the people who have dentures, the particle size is three times as large compared to somebody who has their natural teeth. Why? Because when you have a denture, you know, eating is so, first of all, you, with natural teeth, you can, if you can generate, let's say, 100 pounds per square inch with your natural teeth, with a denture, you can only generate 10 to 15 pounds per square inch. You can generate one-tenth the force with a denture that you can with your natural teeth. So first, how much can you grind up the food? You can't grind it up as well. Number two, denture eater, denture chewer eater people tend to get that food down faster. They don't linger with the food in their mouth. They're just glad they can chew it a couple times, not have the denture move and swallow it. So people have better health because they have better nutrition. And nutrition, not that you can't eat. Denture people say, well, I can eat whatever I want, Doc. I'm eating celery. You're eating celery, but I don't know that you're grinding up that celery. People are eating more chunks. They've done studies where they look at the, the medications people take, and people who wear dentures, on average, take twice as many medications, controlling for everything else, as people who have either their teeth or implants. And the only differing factor there is nutrition, that you can have better nutrition. So some people don't care about the vanity, and some people don't care about the socializing, and some people don't even care about uh, being able to chew better, but everybody cares about living longer. And, uh, and certainly with your teeth, you can have better nutrition. Okay? What other benefits are there? Improved appearance. Again, once we've replaced teeth with implants, you don't have all that bone resorption, you don't have all that collapse of the bite. And you saw so many cases here of people whose teeth weren't the most beautiful teeth in the world, replace them with any kind of teeth you want. You can always have the white teeth you wanted, the straight teeth you wanted. Dr. Waltman has complete control of what they look like. Improved taste for two reasons. Number one, with an upper denture, you don't have the palate covering your denture anymore. And with a lower denture or adhesive, you don't have the adhesive in your mouth, so everything doesn't taste like adhesive, right? So for those of you that use adhesive, how nice would it be not to have to put adhesive in your denture every day and not have that taste of adhesive? <clears throat> Improved hygiene, very easy to brush and keep these things clean. It's not cumbersome or complicated at all. And again, elimination of adhesives, which is really nice. Okay, so we've discussed, I've helped you see some of the ways that we use dental implants to replace missing teeth single teeth, multiple teeth, secure a denture. We've discussed some of the benefits of dental implants. 
Let's discuss for a minute some of the factors in selecting a professional to do your dental implants. Because this is very important. You know, dental implants, um, uh, almost everybody would acknowledge, especially women, that whoever cuts your hair, people wouldn't go just to anyone to cut their hair, right? Everybody's got their own person. Oh, I know Sally, she cuts my hair. I wouldn't trust anyone but her, right? But when it comes to surgery, sometimes people say, well, I'll just go to anybody. They're all dentists, right? But there's a huge difference. So what do you want to look for in choosing someone to place your implants? Number one, experience. Experience is critical. And there's a few things that call into experience. Number one is how many years is somebody in practice? I don't know that you want someone who's fresh out of school, um, who's done a couple of cases in school and now is on their learning curve in you, or someone who's been in practice a long time but just added dental implants to their mix of services. There's a real push in the implant companies to sell dental implants to general dentists. And the reason they do that is um, there are 129,000 general dentists in the country and there's only about 15 or 18,000 specialists. So they look at the market and say, well, we'd rather sell you know, 40 implants a year to 100,000 people and 500 implants a year to 18,000 people. Why? First of all, when I, with the volume of implants I buy, I get a much better price from the company. They'd rather sell them at full retail to guys that don't place a lot. But the problem is when you don't place a lot of implants, you don't know what you don't know. So if I place 40 implants a month, 50 implants a month, the average general dentist who places implants maybe is placing 40 implants a year. Less than a tenth of what an experienced surgeon will do. And with that, um, you just can't do something as, as easily and with low, as low complication. There was just an article on CNN on the website a couple days ago where they looked at people who were having endocrine surgery, like thyroid surgery or adrenal gland surgery, that kind of thing. And what they said was that uh, surgeons who were in the, the lowest, in terms of volume, who did the lowest volume of surgery, so like 15 or 20 percent of the, like 15 percent of the surgeons who had the lowest volume accounted for 30 percent of all the complications that people had. Because they just didn't do it a lot. Didn't do it a lot. Who do the baseball players go to for Tommy John surgery? The guy who does everything or the guy who just does Tommy John surgery five days a week? There's a reason for that, because they know that complications are less and success is greater with greater experience. So you want to look at years in practice, how frequently they do implants and how many they do. And you find somebody's doing 400, 500, 600 implants, 600 implants a year, that's a reasonable volume of implants. The average guy who's putting in you know, 20 implants, 30 implants a year, to me, that's, that's not tremendous volume. And sometimes what they say is, well, I only do the easy cases. I send out the hard cases. Well, okay. Who do you want to go up with in an airplane? The pilot who's flown 10,000 hours and can fly through a hurricane? Or the guy who only flies on a clear sunny day? What happens when the rain cloud comes in and he's caught in a thunderstorm? I don't want to be in a plane with him. The other thing is board certification. And why is that important? So as a periodontist, I can call myself a periodontist if I've completed the educational requirements, which is a three-year program, a three-year postdoctoral program full-time. Board certification is the next, the next level. It's the highest credential a specialist can get. And what that involves is a full-day oral, a written examination and a two-day oral examination. So not only do you have to pass the written test, but you have to be examined with a team of examiners, three or four people examining you at a time. So people who become board certified doesn't mean they're better than the others, but it's a credential that shows you they've been examined by a third party, not that they just graduated from their program. Okay. What about a warranty? To me, a warranty is very important, right? So everybody here has bought a car at some point in their life, right? Would you buy a $30,000 car without a warranty? No. Would you? No. You wouldn't buy a $30,000 car. No, i Right. Right. I wouldn't buy a $30,000 car without a warranty, and yet people have dental implant surgery done all the time and don't even think to ask, well, what's the warranty? Okay. Most dental implant surgeons will warranty the implant so that if they put the implant in and it doesn't fuse with the bone, it's rejected or whatever, the surgeon will put another implant in. Okay? I don't think that's adequate. I, my personal opinion is that if someone does a dental implant and it's done well and the patient takes care of it, it should last forever. It should last for the lifetime of an individual. So I warranty my implants for 10 years. I'll tell you why 10 years in a minute, but my feeling is, is if I do the case and something happens in those 10 years, I'll replace it at no charge. And the reason it's 10 years is that I don't know if I'm going to be practicing 15 years from now. And I know I'm not going to be practicing for my whole life. So to say to a patient, lifetime warranty, it's disingenuous. It obligates my successor to something. And who knows if he's going to want that obligation. But I know um, 
but I know I'll be around at least 10 years, and my guess is if I'm around in a year 11 and something happens, I'm going to take care of it anyway because, you know, goodwill is the most important thing you could ever have in a professional practice. So I think you should look for a warranty and don't, don't ask for anything less than 10 years. Why not, why not get that? You're going to spend a lot of money for this and you want it to last. So if you, if you bought a car for $30,000, but 20 years later it still smelled, drove like a new, it looked like a new car, would you say that's a good investment? Of course it is. Of course, that's a great investment, right? So was the car cheap? It wasn't cheap, but was it a good value? It was an excellent value. So that's the difference between price and value. So look for a warranty. What about the team approach? <clears throat> what does that mean, the team approach? So team is together, everyone accomplishes more, right? I wonder which came first, that acronym or the word. Probably the word. Um, so there are some dentists who are kind of uh, jack of all trades, you know? You go to them, they do the implant surgery, they put the tooth on the implant, they do everything. And then there are dentists, like me, who just put the implant in, I specialize in that, and, and dentists like Dr. Waldman who make the crown on top of the implant. So each has advantages and disadvantages. So what's the advantage of going to a jack of all trades? What a lot of people like about that is that in their mind it's easier. So they just go to one office, they just have one office to deal with, the guy does everything for them and they're out the door. And I, you can't argue that it's a little bit easier. But the disadvantage of that is how much expertise can he have in both disciplines and what, what can he bring to the table, right? I spend 100 hours a year going to CE courses just to stay on top of what's new in dental implant surgery. And I know Dr. Waltman does the same, maybe even more, because the whole field of restorative dentistry is evolving just as fast as perio. So when we work together, I don't worry about the advances in, in his field because I have enough time keeping up with this in my field. It takes a tremendous amount of time. So if I did both, how could I possibly keep up with both, right? If you went to the doctor, your internist, and your internist said, you know, you need a stent in your heart, what would you think to yourself? I'm going to St. Francis or Good Sam, and I'm going to see a cardiologist, and he's going to put the stent in, right? If your internist said, hey, you know what? I do these stents like once or twice a month. Come on in, let me put the stent in your heart. You're like, what, are you crazy, right? But in dentistry, somehow, we think that that's normal, but it's not. Many of you grew up in a time where the, the Family dentists did everything, right? It was a, there, was, there was almost no specialist when most of you were kids, probably. So in your mind, you think, well, why can't the, the same dentist do everything? And the reason is that there's so much more to know now and there's so much more advanced. So I think the team approach is better because it doesn't cost any more, but each person brings their A game to the table, and I think the patient gets the best out of that. Okay? Before and after photos. Why is that important? Well, I don't have before and after photos. I mean, I show other people's cases, but I don't make the teeth. So for me to show before and after, it doesn't matter. But when you're choosing a dentist to make your teeth, you want to look at those before and after photos because the, he should have a book. Any dentist worth their soul is going to have a book of what their cosmetic dentistry looks like. And if you look in that book and you don't like the way it looks, don't go to that dentist, right? If you were having a facelift done or some other cosmetic surgery and this, you went to the surgeon and every facelift looked like the cat woman, remember a few years ago that woman, the cat woman? If every surgery looked like that, you wouldn't go to that person. So if you have a dentist who doesn't have a book or you look in the book and it doesn't look great, go to another dentist because they won't, chances of them making you happy are slim. And there's a big difference between the, the aesthetic capability of, from one dentist to the next. Huge difference. Before and after photos, look at patient satisfaction. So it's very easy now to go on the internet and kind of research your doctor to find out what they're all about. And this is always my recommendation to people what to look for. Number one, Certainly if you see a guy that has 22 negative listings and that's all they have and all people griping and not one kind word, you can probably guess that there's some issues there with that dentist. But realize, um, and then at the other end of the extreme, you know, a good dentist will probably have all positive reviews and just a couple of bad reviews. Number one, for two reasons. Number one, you can't please everyone. And number two, um, there's not a small amount of blackmail that goes on. So. Um, sometimes you have a disgruntled employee who says, oh, that guy fired me, I'm going to get back at him. And who knows, they start posting all kinds of anonymous stuff online. Or you have a patient that's unhappy that they didn't pay their bill and then, you know, they say, well, if you send me to collections, I'm going to post bad stuff about you. That stuff goes on, right? So there's a lot of dishonesty in that respect. So I always say, take the bad ones with a grain of salt and look at the preponderance of the evidence. You know, is it mainly one side or the other side? So that's pretty easy to, uh, to check out. And then lastly, I can't stress enough ongoing training, how important that is. <laughs> I'm out of, so 100 hours of training a year, if, you're in, if you practice you know, roughly 30 or 40 hours a week, 100 hours is taking two and a half hours, 
two and a half weeks out of the office a year to take courses. Two and a half weeks, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of time to take out. And I know Dr. Wolfman does the same thing. And I wish I could stay on top of things without doing that, but you can't. There's so much to learn and so much to, you know, it's always changing. So unless, you want, unless I want to practice like I practiced 10 years ago, which I don't want to do, or Dr. Wolfman, you always have to take these courses. So ask the dentist, how many hours of CE do you have? How many do you take a year? To give you an idea, the state mandates that we take 15 hours a year. That's the minimum. 15 hours is nothing. That's two days a year, which to me is obscene that they even have to require that. But ask, how many hours do you take? Okay. That's not a, an, an unfair question. Okay. So now you have some background in how to select somebody to do your implants. Let's talk about cost, because cost obviously is important. What do these things cost? So everybody take out your agenda if you can, and now is a good time to take some notes. So jot down, some of you know kind of what your amount is, but it's always good to jot down some notes, and, um, and especially keep this piece of paper, because sometimes people come to the consultation and we give them the exact same fee that was up here, and they're astonished. And I say, no, we discussed that in the seminars, and I showed them the slides, so just jot this down. Realize that every case is different, but these numbers are pretty close. So first, what does it cost to replace one tooth? Like that woman, Terry, I showed you, who lost his bottom one or the upper one up there. So one tooth is $4,700. Okay? And to give you an idea, that's about $90 a month. Right? So what else in our life is $90 a month? Cable TV bill, cell phone bill, going out to dinner once, you know, one night a month. So if you put it in context of some other things in our life, that's about that. What about a full arch? A full arch, typically, depending on the type of bridge, is about twenty-seven to thirty thousand dollars. So that's the type of bridge that doesn't come in and out of your mouth. That's fixed in place. Okay, so you don't have to take it out if you're in the hospital or whatever. And to give you a sense, that's about four hundred and fifty dollars a month. So that's a car payment, right? That's a car payment. Or if you bought your house in the in the in the seventies, it was your mortgage payment. <laughs> um, but that's a car payment. The difference is when you've paid off your car payment, what's your car? It's a piece of junk, right? You're ready to get rid of your car. This, when the payment is done, it still looks like it did the day you drove it off the lot, if you will. So there's a big difference there. What about those cases where we do a snap-in, snap-out denture? I showed you those two implants in the bottom. So let's say you have a lower denture that's loose, and you want two implants so it can snap in and out. So that's $6,300, okay, or $129 a month, $129 a month, and that's if your existing denture is good. So if you have a pretty new denture that's in good shape, we can use that denture to do this sort of thing. If your denture is old and beaten up and the, it's worn and everything like that, it may not be wise to use that denture, in which case this type of uh, situation would be $9,700 for a new denture. And that's about $200 a month, $198 a month, to give you an idea. Okay. So realize also that these fees are complete. So. Um, that's the fee. It's not that you come in and, you know, a lot of places, uh, unfortunately, sort of run an ad in the newspaper or get you in the door with something cheap and then upsell, upsell, upsell until eventually you left and it was more than if you had just done the job right in the first place. So those are the complete fees. Realize that every case is different. So somebody may need extraction. Somebody may need bone grafts. Um, and those things are different, uh, you know, additional cost, obviously, because every case is different. But it's a good idea to have a sense of where these things are. There are certainly affordable payment options like I showed you. So, you know, $90 a month, $129 a month, $450 a month. Again, it's like a car payment. It's like a cell phone payment. It's like a dinner out a month or two dinners out a month. So, for many people, that's how they, they make those sort of financial arrangements, and that's how they fit, in, fit it into your bu their budgets. Um, for some people with dental insurance, dental insurance many times contributes towards dental implants. Most insurance plans have a yearly maximum of maybe $1,000 or $1,500. So rarely does the dental insurance cover everything, but it's kind of like a scholarship, you know? You're sending your kid to school and the tuition's $40,000 a year and they got a $3,000 scholarship. Well, it's still $37,000 a year to send them to school, but that scholarship is a nice thing. So sometimes we tell people, look at your dental insurance almost like a scholarship. Some people put it on a credit card. Some people use home equity loans. Some people borrow from their pension. Um, and depending on your income, there could be tax savings. So when your medical expenses exceed a certain threshold, your, your expenses beyond that threshold um, become tax deductible. So the government chips in for some of that, depending on your income. Okay, so you have that. And just realize that our fees are middle of the market. You know, we don't have the highest fees, and we don't have the, the lowest fees. So you may ask yourself, well, why not go to a practice that charges less, right? It's always nice to save money, isn't it? I love to save money. 
But you have to think about quality and service. You, this is a service, it's not a product. What's the difference? So if you're buying paper towels and you go to Costco, it's cheaper to buy the paper towels in Costco than in Stop and Shop, right? But the paper towels are all made in the same place. With a dental implant, you're not buying an implant, you're buying the service of the dentist or the surgeon who's putting it in and what they bring to the table. Okay? So, um, uh, it's not all the same. So if you called Peter Luger's and asked how much a steak dinner is, and they said a steak dinner is, everybody know Peter Luger's in Great Neck, right, that steak restaurant? So um, if you call a fine steak restaurant and say how much is a steak dinner, and they say well, it's you know, $85 a person, and you, you, you call the Golden Corral and say how much is a steak dinner, and they say it's $7.95 all you can eat, you're all savvy enough to know, well, it's not the same steak dinner you're getting for $7.95 as you are for $70, right? Um, and the same thing holds true for dental implants. It may seem like it's the same. It's a dentist, it's an implant. Trust me, it's not the same. Um, because really, when will you know if the surgical procedure was done properly or not? You go to a cheapo place, you know, this or that. How are you gonna know, when are you gonna know when it was done properly? After it's done. And by then it's too late. And unfortunately, I spend a lot of my time, more than I like, repairing these other types of cases where they're not done properly. And invariably, um, it's much more expensive to fix and, and then redo than it would have been to just do it right the first time and not have any, any headaches. So if I could give you some free advice, avoid bargains when purchasing parachutes, scuba gear, and dental implant surgery. Okay, so so far we've discussed some common concerns. We've discussed how implants can improve your smile. We've discussed the cost of dental implants. We've discussed some factors in uh, selecting the best professional. So what's next? Dr. Wolman and I want to offer everybody that's come here tonight a free consultation and 3D dental x-ray. And that's normally uh, $425. First, why can we do it for free? We, I, I typically don't give free consults to either this gym. But by coming down tonight, we will spend a lot of time educating you all in a very efficient manner. So when people come into the office without a seminar like this, it takes a lot of time to talk to them and educate them and screen them and see if they're the right patient. We've done all that for you, so we want to pass that savings on to you. And who's this for? It's not for everybody. It's for the people who are interested in moving forward to see if they're a real candidate based on what we've discussed here tonight in terms of cost and time. Right? So you may be thinking, okay, this fits in my budget, I understand the time, I understand it can help me, but I wonder if I'm really a candidate for this based on my bone and my situation. Well, this consultation is for you. If based on what we said to you tonight, you say, you know what, the time doesn't seem right, or the, the, I, there's no way that I can fit this into my budget, then now's not a good time for you, because what's the, what's the point of coming if you know already that you're not a candidate? This is for the people who want to take the next step to see if they are. Um, and what we're going to do first, we ask that you come within two weeks, because we've given you a lot of information tonight, and as time passes, the information fades. So if you come within two weeks, it's fresh in your mind, um, and the purpose is to examine your smile. We're going to recommend the best procedure to solve your problem, whatever you tell us that that is. And then um, we'll take x-rays to identify the problem areas. And believe me, there's no obligation. Just like coming down tonight, we're happy to provide you with the information. But by the end of that consultation, you'll know for sure if dental implants are for you and if now is the right time. And certainly if there's not, there's no obligation. Because even not today, sometime tomorrow or the next day may be the right time for you. Okay. So, uh, as an additional sort of inducement for everybody, if you want to schedule your appointment tonight before you leave, Angela and um, uh, Stacy, getting old. Angela and Stacy, too much dentures here. Angela and Stacy uh, have our schedules. So, what we want to give anyone that schedules their appointment tonight is a, is a discount certificate for a $400 discount off your dental implant treatment. So if we said something was $4,400, with that certificate, it'll only be $400, uh, $4,000, rather. Um, and that certificate is only for the people who decide to schedule tonight before they leave. That's a little inducement uh, to get it done. All right? So if you could open your folders now, and on the right-hand side, behind our welcome letter, is a survey. So if you could take a minute, and just complete the seminar evaluation form. Your feedback is very important to us uh, in terms of how we can improve the night, what you thought, what we could do better, what we could do worse. So let's take a minute and fill that out.
And then when you're done, the ladies will come around and pick those up. And then we'll, um, we'll, just, we'll go through some questions and answers. <coughs> Stacy and Angel will come around and pick those up. And then we'll go through some, uh, some questions. No rush, no rush.
and we and uh, we'd like we'd like you to come in within two weeks if possible. Some people are traveling or they're out of the area; they can't. But if at all possible, it's to your benefit to come in uh, sooner rather than later. So I just want to touch on some of the most frequent questions that people ask, and then we'll we'll open it up for some questions if you have any. Okay. So first, the common question people have is, do I have enough bone? If I lost my teeth because I lost bone, how can you put implants in? Is my bone strong enough? Those are very common worries people have. And sometimes people have been told in the past that they don't have enough bone. That's no longer an issue uh, in terms of guessing. So we have a machine called the Dentiscan. And in effect, it takes a 3D x-ray of the jaw, like a CAT scan. And it shows us, before we even touch you, how much bone you have and how strong that bone is. So that we can design the case in such a way to be successful. And if it's a case where you don't have enough bone, we, we look and we either grow the bone, which many times is possible, or unfortunately, sometimes we have to say, you know what, you're not an implant candidate because you don't have enough bone. But that's not too common. Will my new teeth look natural? Certainly, if you have a dentist like Dr. Wolfman make your teeth, they can look like whatever you want. They can look as natural as you want. Um, so that's not an issue. It's, a, it's, it's all the talent of the dentist that makes them. <clears throat> Does it hurt? That's a pretty common question. Everyone smiles. Oh, it's got to hurt, right? So implants don't hurt, and here's why. First, there are, no, there are no nerve endings in the bone. So a tooth is one of the most sensitive parts of the, the body, and the ligament that holds the tooth in is also very sensitive. The bone itself isn't very sensitive at all. So I can put in two implants in the front of someone's jaw for less Novocaine than you would need to have a crown put on a tooth. That's how easy it is to get that area numb. So we give you the Novocaine, we wait a few minutes, it gets nice and numb, we do our treatment, we don't feel anything. The vast majority of patients just take Motrin and Tylenol afterwards. It's very rarely does somebody need anything stronger than that. Depending on how many implants we do, sometimes there is some swelling and bruising, which we tend to we prepare people for based on the size of their case. So sometimes that's significant, but in terms of discomfort, there's none during the surgery, and afterwards, uh, little to none. Typically. I mean, if anything, it's that night after the surgery. In fact, I stepped out before we started to call the gentleman that I did his surgery today. He's 81 years old. We did two implants in the lower front. He says, I can't believe this. It doesn't hurt at all. I was prepared for the worst. I said, all right, you can come to next month's seminar <laughs> and get up and tell everyone. But it really doesn't hurt. And for people that have high dental anxiety, it's not a problem. We just have the anesthesiologist come in. You get sedated. You wake up, and it's all over. So for people who want to take advantage of that, that's a nice thing. How long will I have to go without teeth? That's always a, a, a real big concern. So let me give you some idea. When we do those full upper cases or full lower case, where we're taking out teeth, putting implants in the same day, the, the bridge goes on the next day. So we take an impression, it goes to the lab, and the next day your beautiful new strong teeth go into your mouth. So it's less than 24 hours. Depending on what type of case it is, so if it's this type of case where we're doing two implants in the bottom of the jaw, you can weigh your denture the same day if you want. We're not going to attach the denture to the implants for a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of months, but you could wear the denture the same day. Truthfully, most people leave it out for a week or so because it's tender. You know, the denture is pressing right over where they had the surgery. But one thing's for sure, we always discuss with you, so in, in situations where how you look is significant, you don't want to walk around without teeth, we discuss that well in advance. Like we don't finish the surgery and say, oh, by the way, you have to walk around with no teeth for a month, good luck. <clears throat> That's all discussed way in advance. And suffice it to say, almost without exception, there's a way to work it out so that if you have to have teeth in your mouth, you can have teeth in your mouth. We wouldn't ask anybody to walk around, but certainly we wouldn't surprise them with, with that. What is the success rate of dental implants? Can I reject a dental implant? What if it doesn't take? That's something we hear as well. So when we put an implant in the bone, we're relying on the implant fusing with the bone. And in fact, once that implant fuses, the bond of the implant to the bone is stronger than the bond of your bone to your bone. So if we, if we try and break your jaw, you're <coughs> before the implant breaks out. That's how strong it is. Um, but, and so when we put the implant in, that the rate at which it fuses, it fuses about 98% of the time. So 98 out of 100 implants we put in, fuse with the bone. 2% of the implants, for reasons we don't understand, don't fuse, and we just replace them. There's no charge to do that. Um, so that's the success rate. It's not that your body would reject it like you reject a kidney or an organ transplant. Think of it more like if you break, you know, everyone knows someone who say broke a bone, and they put a cast on, and then even though the cast was on for six weeks, the bone didn't mend and they had to reset it. That's maybe a better analogy. So it's not that it never happens, and anyone that tells you, oh, I have a 100% success rate, 
Don't believe them. <laughs> it, all that means is that they are lucky and they haven't done many implants yet. So um, uh, no one has 100%. But in general, nothing we do in dentistry is as successful as this. Okay. What kind of care do implants need long term? Right. So they need nothing more than your natural teeth need. You need to brush them. A lot of people we have use a water pick, which is very easy to do, and get your teeth cleaned a couple times a year. Nothing more heroic than that. Okay, you don't have to spend hours in the bathroom. What about, are there any medical conditions that <coughs> exclude somebody from being an implant candidate? And there are some, not many. Number one is um, if someone has uncontrolled diabetes, right? So if you have diabetes but it's under control, we place plenty of implants in, in well-controlled diabetics, it's not a problem. It's the people with these crazy blood sugars that are out of control that are poor implant candidates. Number two, um, and that's really the main one. If you um, if you've been uh, if you have take Coumadin or anything like that, that's not a problem at all. Or Plavix, any of those uh, anticoagulants. Typically, we don't even stop those medications. If you take Coumadin, you know what an INR is. You have it done frequently. As long as your INR is three or less, we do the implant <coughs> surgery. It's not a problem. We don't we don't stop the Coumadin. So that's it. Other than the uncontrolled diabetes, for the most part, um, there were no other reasons you can't have implants. A common question we say is, oh, am I too old for implants or, oh, I'm too old for implants? <laughs> it's either a question or a statement. Um, so whenever I get that, that question or that statement, I like to tell the story about Molly. So this is Molly in 2005, 2008, 2012, and 2013. And Molly's my grandmother, right? So I've always been very, very close with my grandmother. When I was seven, my grandfather passed away, and she came to live with us for a while, and she shared a bedroom with me. So, you know, when you share a bedroom with your grandmother, you come pretty close. And um, so I can tell you stories like I woke up once at like five in the morning to go to the bathroom, I came back, my bed was made. That's a true story. <laughs> like, Grandma, I'm not done sleeping yet. So, uh, so my whole life, I've been very close with her ever since that. And um, so she was about 10 years younger than my other set of grandparents. My mother's parents were 10 years older than this grandmother. And um, my grandmother, on my mother's side, always had dentures, upper and lower dentures. And she would ask me about implants, but she, she would like ask in tangential ways. Oh, how are these implants? What are these things? And I knew she wore dentures, but I knew that she wasn't, she was curious, but she didn't want to tell me that she wore dentures. And I didn't want to say, hey, Grandma, I know you wear dentures. I can help you. So I just let it be, and, and that was that. And then my grandfather had partial dentures, you know, that came in and out with clasps. And so my grandmother <coughs> passed away first at the age of 91. And my grandfather then was, you know, living by himself, and he was living with an aide for three or four years. And he was in his 90s as well, and his dental health really started to deteriorate to the point where he couldn't wear his partial dentures anymore, right? And he loved to eat. I mean, he just, food was just his passion, you know? And he was a skinny guy. Was, I got my, my body type for him. He was tall and skinny, but he loved to eat. And it killed me to see him in the final years of his life. I mean, he lost his wife, he lost his mobility, he couldn't see very well, he couldn't get around. And he couldn't eat, you know, that like the one joy he couldn't have anymore. And it broke my heart, but at the time he was too sick, to, he was too frail really to do anything for. So I just, we watched him deteriorate, but he was too frail for me to help him. So then he passed away, and then fast forward now to this grandmother 10 years later. And when she was 91, she lived independently up till age 90, and then at 91 she moved to assisted living. And at 91 for, she changed her medications, and seven teeth had to be extracted. They decayed very, very rapidly. So. She had all her teeth up to age 91, and then she lost seven of them I had to take out. And the day I took out those teeth, I took out four teeth one day and three teeth another day, and the day I took out those teeth, I put the implants right in, same day. And it was my grandmother, so I didn't even tell her, right? I said, Grandma, I'm just gonna take these out, and I'm gonna put something in the socket for you. She said, okay. I didn't tell her it was gonna be an implant in the socket. And it was my grandmother, so I didn't have to worry about it. So then she goes home, and fast forward, you know, a couple months later, I make teeth on top of the implants for her. And she doesn't think anything of it. You know, she just comes in, does the thing, she leaves. And I saw her a couple months later at a family thing. She says, I got a question for you. She goes, I know you took out my teeth, and now I have my teeth back again. How'd you do that? <laughs> and I said, oh, Grandma, I put dental implants in for you. And she goes, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And then she started to worry like, like she had dental implants. So my point is that you're never too old. You're never too old, right? So when she was 91, First of all, if I thought I was going to hurt her or cause her trauma, a right? 91-year-old, and she wasn't lifting weights at age 91, she was 91, right? I don't care how good a shape you are, she's still 91. And all she took afterwards was Tylenol. She didn't take anything else. And I always think, like, I kid, with, I kid that um, she was so proud of her grandson doing her surgery that she had all these endorphins, that she didn't need any pain medicine at all. But if I thought it was going to stress her or hurt her or be you know, ill-advised, I would never have done it for her. 
But what I really didn't want is I didn't want whatever year she had left to be like my other grandparents, who really, my grandfather especially, who really suffered later in life and couldn't, you know, couldn't enjoy himself. So, uh, so fast forward, she was 91, and she just had, this is at her, her 100th birthday party, and uh, last month, May 15th, she was 101, right, 101. So now she's in a nursing home, she's in Gerwin, right, and um, so at the table where the ladies will eat, you know, they all pull up, and uh, uh, the other three women at her table all have no teeth, right, and so they all have the appearance like I showed you, and they take their dentures out, and they put them on the table, and they all curse it that they got to eat more, right? And my grandmother, she can't see anymore, my grandmother. She's completely blind. She has uh, macular degeneration, right? So she lost her sight, and she's pretty got most of her wits about her still. But um, it makes me feel great to know that she can still eat whatever she wants. And all these other women just complain, ah, oh, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And I go to visit, and she always introduces me as my, you know, my grandson, the dentist. So of course they have to tell me about how their dentures, they pull them out and show me, but they're on the table. So I try not to visit her at mealtime anymore. But that, you only have to do that once or twice. Um, but I always think to myself that, you know, they're complaining about their dentures at whatever age they're at. And I think to myself, you know what? Rewind five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. At some point in your life, there was a, a decision point where you decided either consciously or unconsciously not to address your situation. And you didn't address your situation when you had the chance, and now you don't have a chance. You know, it's done. So my grandmother now at 100 or 101, I, she's not healthy enough to do any kind of surgery on. Um, but I was certainly glad that when she was 91 that I did it for her. So if you think you're too old, I don't think anyone in this room is 91. Uh, so if you think you're too old, think again. And you can call my grandma. She'd be happy to talk to you and tell you. So and what's funny was she'd be in my office in the reception area, and um, she'd be talking about how wonderful Dr. Sharp is. So like, Grandma, it's probably like unethical to say, like, talk about the dentist and not let them know you're, I'm your grandson. Uh, so that's that. So let's open it up for any questions. If there's anything I haven't addressed or you have any particular questions, um, now is a good time to discuss that. Yeah? Uh, you said one tooth is... Uh 4,700. Mm -hmm. What if you have two right next to each other? Mm -hmm. Is it double the price? Or, or is it so it depends. At the same time? That's a great question. So his question is, well, what if you have two teeth next to each other? Yeah. Uh, is it double the price? And it depends on the teeth. So <laughs> let's say that it's a certain, in some circumstances, you can put two teeth on top of one implant, right? So if it's a low, let's say it's a lower incisor, a lower front tooth, right? You can put one implant in and put two teeth on top of that. Let's say it's an upper front tooth, a central incisor and a lateral incisor, or a canine and a lateral incisor. In those situations, you can put one implant in and put two teeth on top. How much is two teeth on top? So if it's 47, what was the number? 4,400, 4,700? So if it's 4,700 for one implant and one tooth, how much would it be for one implant and two teeth? Another 1500 But if you have two teeth that are big chewing teeth, like molar teeth or teeth that have a lot of force, you need two implants and two teeth. So whether they're next to each other or not near each other, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? Yes? I have a question on the, um, you said if you were using your dentures, it was 6300 But if you didn't have your own dentures, it would be 97 Right. Does that include the two implants, or is it 63 yes. and 97? That includes, my question was, I gave a fee of 6,300 or 90-something 90 hundred for an over-denture, if you don't have a denture. So that 9,700 fee is complete. It includes the implants and the denture. Yes. Yeah. Good question. Yes? Are you two complete artists? Do you have financial plans? Do we have financial Of course we do. So, um, uh, and there's different ways to do it, but some of the, remember some of that slide I showed with some of the monthly payments? Do I want to go back to that? Remember that slide? Should I go back? <coughs> Should I go back? No, I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we offer that to all our patients. So, sometimes people stage it. They do one arch. So, sometimes people do top and bottom arches each of implants. Sometimes, if that doesn't fit in their budget, they do one arch of a denture. Usually, the top arch, they do a denture, and then the bottom arch, they do implants. So, but we do offer monthly payments to make it, uh, make it affordable. And those numbers give you a sense of what those monthly payments are like. So absolutely. Very good. How about over here? You guys have any questions? Nothing? Was that good? All right. I'll take it. Thank you. Yes? A couple of questions. What is the uh, 
And the infection probability is the it's a good question. Her question was, what is the infection probability? And um, it's exceedingly rare to have an infection after dental implant surgery. Um, in fact, <clears throat> so typically what we do for antibiotics is we give one dose of antibiotic before the surgery, and that's it, nothing else. If you're diabetic, typically we follow up with, uh, with more antibiotic, but um, we'll go years and years between an infection after implant surgery. Sometimes if there's bone grafting involved, the bone graft is a little, there's more likely to be an infection with the bone graft, um, but with an implant that's way less than 1%, way less, you know. But realize, that, that's in my office. I can't tell you what other people do, but we take tremendous precautions. You know, we, you know, we take every precaution possible to make sure someone doesn't have an infection. And the fact that I've done a lot of implants and I can do them relatively quickly decreases your infection rate as well. So an implant that will take me 10 minutes to do, when I work with one of the residents at the school, it can take them two hours to do. So if, that, if the gum is open for two hours, you're much more likely to get an infection than if it's open for 10 minutes. So if I can pay in my office, it's less than 1%. And for those of us, for example, who have replacement knees or micro valves and things like that, usually before going to the dentist, we take, we take antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Is that the same when you have transplants? Yes, it's the exact same regimen. Two grams of amoxicillin or 600 clindamycin. Before? Before? Yeah. And you, you said uh, you give it in the office an hour before? No, usually what we do, she's asking about taking the antibiotic beforehand. Usually what we do is we give somebody a prescription for the antibiotic. And just like you would pre-medicate for a hip, right. you take the pills one hour before the appointment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anything else? Thank you. My pleasure. Any questions? Yes. Um, you removed the tooth first, right? Yes. Before, and you put the, you have anesthesia? Will you knock the person out? Yes, we do. Oh, so please. depending on what the patient wants, we can either just give them Novocaine. We have something in the office called Nucom, which helps them relax but they're awake. Or we have an anesthesiologist come in who starts an IV yeah. and sedates you so that you're knocked out, as you say. Is there an extra charge for that? Yes, there is. The anesthesiologist charges Stace. Stace. How much is the anesthesiologist? So the 450 for each half or hour? Hour. Okay. So the anesthesiologist is 750 for the first hour, and then 450 each additional hour. So to give you an idea, like let's say you're doing one or two implants, even three or four implants, if they're in probably one or two, certainly a one implant case or two implant case is under an hour in terms of surgery time. Those cases I showed you, say two implants in the front of the mouth, that's probably about an hour. The type of case I showed you where we take out someone's teeth and put in four implants and make the bridge. Those take usually three and a half to four and a half hours to do. So, you know, to give you a sense. And the anesthesiologist just charges by time. So, uh, and I always kid, he doesn't charge to put you asleep, he charges to wake you up. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, I can only have like one, two, two, one mole of it. I cracked the mole. Uh -huh. And they told me I either have to have a small bridge right. or an implant. Right. So I left it like this because I don't know which way to go. Well, let me give you the pros and cons of each. The problem with the dental bridge is that now you've taken a one tooth problem and made it a two tooth problem. So the adjacent teeth have to be ground down. Has anybody here ever had a cap or a bridge that got cavities under it and had to be replaced? It's very common, right? So especially if those adjacent teeth haven't had restorations in them, now you've removed the enamel and you have to restore them. Number two, whenever you prepare a tooth for a crown, a small percentage of those end up needing root canals because the trauma to the tooth of the crown. And if you've ever had a root canal, you know that a root canal isn't always successful, right? So a three-unit bridge um, has those downsides to it. The only advantage of a three-unit bridge is you don't have any surgery to do if you don't consider cutting a tooth surgery. I consider that hard tissue surgery. But remember I, s I showed you when you remove a tooth that the bone isn't stimulated anymore and the bone starts to resorb and melts away? So with a three-tooth bridge, it doesn't replace the root. So there's nothing to stimulate the bone so the bone withers, it atrophies in that area and gets narrower. When you do an implant, first many times we take out the tooth and put the implant in the same day like I did for my grandmother. So it's one procedure, it's, it's not an extra procedure like if you, you're taking out the tooth anyway, right? And the implant stimulates the bone so you don't get that resorption. Number two, it keeps a one tooth problem a one tooth problem. You don't have to involve the adjacent teeth. I can tell you as a periodontist, a lot of cases I do, someone has a three tooth bridge and now one of the teeth of that three tooth bridge is cracked. And now, now they have two missing teeth that they have to replace. 
And it all goes back to when they did it the first time. Think of it this way. If you had to lose a leg, right? One of your legs had to come off. And the surgeon could say, look, I can kind of connect the leg to the other leg, but I gotta ruin the other leg. <laughs> and it won't be like your normal leg, but it'll kind of look like a leg. Or I could just put your leg back the way it was. You wouldn't think for a second, you say, put my leg back the way it was. That's really what the implant is. And the other thing is that in terms of cost between a three tooth bridge and a, and a single tooth implant, the cost is pretty close. So the, the dental implant is maybe another 10% upfront, but because it lasts so much longer, the average bridge has to be replaced every five to seven years. That's according to the American Dental Association. And that's why dental implant, dental insurance companies, how often do they pay for a replacement crown or bridge? Every five years, right? Because that's what the data shows. So it may be a